Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Action's webinar, Pink Ribbons, Inc. and Stink, Films That Inspire Change. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Saru Kaiser, and I'm the Program Manager here at Breast Cancer Action. Joining me on the webinar today will be Ravita Din, producer of Pink Ribbons, Inc., and John Whalen, director of the documentary Stink. A few quick announcements before we get started. Breast Cancer Action doesn't take money from any corporation that profits from or contributes to the breast cancer epidemic. Our work is largely supported by individual donors. Please consider making a $25 donation today to support work like these educational webinars. Our presentation of Pink Ribbon Zinc and Stink, Films That Inspire Change, will last about 45 minutes. At any time during the webinar, you can type a question into the question bar at your control panel, which is over on your right, and we'll save time at the end to answer all the questions that we can. We want you to get involved with Breast Cancer Action, and this webinar is a great way to do that. Stay tuned for other ways we'll mention later on in our presentation. So today we're talking about two really powerful documentaries that start from personal stories. And uh, although they start here through film, they both really power larger social movements. Ravita will start by talking about the power of telling personal stories for making change through her film, Pink Ribbons, Inc. Then John will talk about his inspiration for creating the documentary Stink and the problems of chemical regulation in this country that are explored through his film. Both of these films help audiences view important issues through a different lens. For Pink Ribbon Zinc, it's really about the history and impact of breast cancer caused marketing through the use of the pink ribbon. While with Stink, it's about the lack of chemical regulation in this country and the impact it has on our health and our society. And at the end, we'll end with your questions. So Breast Cancer Action was founded in 1990 by a group of women living with breast cancer who realized the power of community. They founded Breast Cancer Action because they saw a need for a grassroots organization with a unique understanding of the political, economic, and social context of breast cancer. Our founders, only one of whom is still alive today, knew that their private medical crises were part of a larger public health emergency and that the experiences of those dealing with breast cancer needed to be heard to address the crises. We are the only organization that addresses the breast cancer epidemic at the intersection of breast cancer, the environment, social justice, and feminism. And our mission is to achieve health justice for all women at risk of and living with breast cancer. So in order to do uh, the work that we do, we have a number of core values. We believe in health justice as a human right. We believe in honesty, fearlessness, and truth-telling about the breast cancer epidemic. We also believe in honoring women's diverse voices and lived experiences, and that people's health and well-being should come over corporate profits. We believe in transparency and accountability for ourselves and others, and that collective action changes the world for the better. And last, we believe in integrity and freedom from conflict of interest. So our core values are really grounded in a, a commitment to social justice. We recognize that the issues of health and social justice are really intertwined. And it's why we made a really clear commitment to social justice as the foundation to all of our work. And I wanted to talk to you about uh, four pieces of that. So the first is around an unequal burden of disease. We know that the breast cancer epidemic impacts communities unequally and leads to unacceptable differences in who develops breast cancer and when it develops, who gets high quality and timely treatment, and who dies from breast cancer. We also know that in order to address and end the breast cancer epidemic, we must tackle the root causes of these health inequities, which are often the result of a complex interplay of culture, power, economics, racism, and sexism. We believe that no single injustice can effectively be addressed in isolation. And we recognize that injustices in our society reinforce each other in many different ways and at many different levels. And last but not least, in our work for health justice, we strive to be an ally by using the power and privilege we hold as an organization to build solidarity with communities who currently or traditionally have had less access to power, information, and resources. Now, all of that, our core values and our commitment to social justice, is the foundation uh, for our work. And now I'm just going to talk through very quickly the three areas uh, of the work that we do. So as the watchdog for the breast cancer movement, we educate, organize, and take action 
in sort of three, three areas of work. The first is around our work on diagnosis, screening, and treatment. And our work here examines the data from a patient perspective and includes breast cancer screening, healthcare access, drug and device approval, and demanding more effective, less costly, and less toxic treatment. Our second area is our work around addressing the root causes of breast cancer. And this really focuses on eliminating the involuntary exposures to hazardous and toxic, toxic chemicals present in all of our daily lives that put us at risk of breast cancer. And the last is really around pink ribbon marketing and culture. And our work in this area is really about cutting through the pink noise to tell the hard truths about this disease and challenge pinkwashing hypocrisy and the pink ribbon culture that have become the status quo of the breast cancer industry. I'd like to introduce our speakers. The first is John Whalen. He got his MBA while dabbling in virtual reality. He is the director of Stink, an offbeat documentary about Whalen's tenacious quest to uncover the source of a chemical scent in a pair of his daughter's pajamas. Like most Americans, he believed that if a product was on a store shelf, then it must be safe. Through his investigation, he discovers a culture of secrecy surrounding carcinogens in everyday consumer products that begins in corporate boardrooms and extends all the way to the halls of Congress. Formerly co-CEO of AfterNick.com, internet media startup advisor, and a founding member of the New York Angels. He currently advocates for truthful product labeling and is a full-time parent of two young daughters. Welcome, John. Our other presenter is Ravita Din. She's a Canadian film pr producer who formerly served for the National Film Board of Canada as a producer, executive producer, then as its director general of English language production. Her producing credits with the NFB included the documentary st film Status Quo, The Unfinished Business of Feminism in Canada, Up the Yangtze, Real Engine, Pink Ribbons Inc., and Payback, based on Margaret Atwood's book Payback debt, and the shadow side of wealth. For Pink Ribbons Inc., Din approached director Leah Poole after having researched and lived with the subject of breast cancer for four years. A breast cancer survivor, Din has been diagnosed at a, had been diagnosed at approximately the same time as she first read Samantha King's book Pink Ribbons Inc., Breast Cancer and the Politics of Philanthropy, and Barbara Ehrenreich's autobiographical essay, Welcome to Cancerland. Welcome, Ravita. I'm now going to turn it over. To Ravita. Thank you, Saru, and uh, I also want to thank the team at Breast Cancer Action for inviting me to present, and thanks to everyone who's joined us today in this conversation. The topic of my presentation is the personal is political. In other words, it's about how we become our own subjects of interest, individually and collectively, and that the work to end sexist oppression is fundamentally political work. Becoming our own subjects of interest is to become aware of our own potential creative energy. Filmmaking, in one's point of view, can be understood as a politics of constructed meaning. Whether you narrate in your own words what you have understood from the other person, or whether you use a person directly on screen as a piece of oral testimony to serve the direction of your film, you're dealing with the translation of ideas, cultural, historical, and political. The slide that you see shows the first breast cancer ribbon that was ever created. It was in 1991, and its creator, Charlotte Haley, the granddaughter, sister, and mother of women who had been diagnosed with breast cancer. Each set of five peach-colored ribbons came with a card saying, the National Cancer Institute annual budget is $1.8 billion. Only 5% goes for cancer prevention. Help us wake up our legislators and America by wearing this ribbon. So Pink Ribbons, Inc. is a feature documentary, and as Saru mentioned, based on Samantha King's book, Breast Cancer and the Politics of Philanthropy, and it's directed by the highly acclaimed Canadian director, Leah Poole. The idea for the documentary film began not long after I had undergone treatment for breast cancer. My sister, who had also gone through treatment in the same year, had sent me this article by Barbara Ehrenreich well, entitled, Welcome to Cancerland. It was a defining moment because that essay reminded me that I had forgotten something. In the maze of simply trying to understand the diagnosis, looking at treatment options, and then beginning the treatment, 
I hadn't turned to what gives me coherence and a way of understanding image and language. I hadn't looked at feminist writing on women's health, and I had not yet understood the political in my own personal experience. In recounting her own experiences with breast cancer diagnosis and treatment, Barbara Ehrenreich opened the door to what I believe were and are the most critical questions that must be asked of the breast cancer industry. Not long after I read Barbara Ehrenreich's article, I came across Samantha King's book, and the documentary idea began to take shape. I knew that I wanted to use King's book as a framework from which further research would flow. The book is written from a feminist perspective. It advances a strong thesis on the transformation of a disease from one that was stigmatized and seen as an individual tragedy to a market-driven industry of survivorship. And it provides a historical context for the commercialization of the breast cancer movement. The question that I kept coming back to was this. What difference has raising billions of dollars made to women's lives? We wanted to follow the money, and by doing this to understand how a massive industry has arisen with so many organizations and foundations claiming a stake on the breast cancer movement, indeed with crediting themselves for creating a movement and identifying their quest as to find the cure. I worked with two researchers over an extensive three-year period, and very quickly we realized that this was a massive subject, and every aspect of it opened new and more complex questions. While we wanted the film to retain a tight focus on the commercialization of the breast cancer movement, we also knew that the integrity of the film depended on how well we would be able to present the research with a rigor and an analysis that revealed all of the overlapping circles of thought and ideas. So back to Ehrenreich and King's work, we wanted to look at the central argument that breast cancer had become the biggest disease on the cultural map, not simply because of effective political organizing during the 80s and 90s, but because of an informal alliance of large corporations, major cancer charities, the state and the media, all of whom had emerged around the same time to capitalize on the growing public interest in the disease. In terms of an approach to the film, the idea that the personal is political became an early driver in the way that we approached many of the interviews. And that meant that my own personal experience was often a starting point in many of the conversations with the women who later became key subjects in the film. This was an important tool because it allowed for a conversation that often began with the question, why do you believe that your work, your foundation or organization or company is effective in propelling the kind of change women need and want. It, it allowed for an exploration on the nature of change and on the nature of transformation. And the word transformation is important. Here I don't speak of a change in women's condition, but a radical transformation that changes all assumptions and expectations for the betterment of the lives of women and girls. I was also keenly aware that I didn't want to present the arguments as if there were only two sides, one good and one bad. My approach was to ask the participants in the film to speak directly to the public and to all women, to speak from a personal and a political point of view on why their work mattered. I wanted to capture the nuances of political activism and of the sophisticated marketing machine behind the pink ribbon campaigns. The work of identifying who would speak and for whom was absolutely critical. It was important to get the people behind a mighty foundation like Susan G. Komen or Avon or Ford to speak to the issues. It was important to capture what their movement looked like from their point of view. And it wasn't easy. I was astounded when Nancy Brinker, founder of Susan G. Komen, agreed to be interviewed. And in the first few minutes of meeting her, she made it quite clear that Samantha King's book for her was problematic. Even Barbara Ehrenreich wasn't easy to pin down. It took me a good two years to convince her to participate in the film. The film explores many fundamental themes, uh, the rise of philanthropy and the subject of cause marketing. We go inside some of the campaigns organized by Komen, Estee Lauder, Avon, and the Ford Motor Company, for, for example, the lighting of the monuments. We hear from Barbara Brenner on the work of Breast Cancer Action, in particular, the Think Before You Pink campaigns. 
Judy Brady recounts the founding of the Toxic Links Coalition, which used to organize marches in the financial district in the Bay Area to, to out the worst environmental polluters. Dr. Susan Love talks about her own research and in her biting words of slash, burn, and poison, what our treatment options are. Barbara Ehrenreich, with her wonderful wry humor, dismantles the language of survivorship and the pink culture. Dr. Olapati speaks on the nature of breast cancer research and the fact that most of the research looks at the experience of white middle class women and further marginalizing women of color. We examine how only 15% of the money raised actually goes towards prevention, while campaigns to raise awareness still get the lion's share of funding. The lack of coordination in terms of the research that is carried out means massive duplication and the competitive nature of the work means an unwillingness to create a unified response to the work. We also have Dr. Margaret Keith and Dr. James Brophy talk about their work on breast cancer risk in relation to occupations with exposures to carcinogens and endocrine disruptors. The film is about moral dilemmas, about hard choices when confronted with this disease, about the murky territory of corporate involvement and how that involvement fundamentally changes and has changed the very notion of collective action to bring about social change. It's about a fierce competition between companies to keep and to grow their market share in the fundraising and advocacy field. And it's a film about the collective power that women hold, whether it's one individual who pushes for change or whether it's the thousands that run in a race for the cure. My hope in, with the film was that it would compel each one of us to ask, what is the change that we want to see happen, and how will we participate? Pink Ribbons, Inc. had its world premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2011, where it was named one of the top 10 films of the year. International festivals and Canadian and U.S. theatrical launches led to unprecedented press coverage of over 700 interviews, mentions, and reviews over a one-year period. I've received a lot of positive feedback over the years, with many individual women writing to me saying that the film had a profound impact on the ways that they now think about their own participation in this movement. The most heartening has been when people say, I'm thinking about a new set of questions that need to be asked and that I have a right to ask. I want to come back to the words, the personal is political. In producing this film, I wanted to reclaim this slogan, like so much feminist thought and practice, its original and radical intent has been lost. The term personal is political first held meaning for me when I became active in the women's movement. I was 17. It took form through consciousness raising sessions and that meant women and girls coming together to talk about our ordinary lives and to talk about the extraordinary ways in which we wanted to change the world. Those consciousness raising sessions were the foundation upon which political action was built. And it occurs to me that it was also about being brave, that the mere act of placing value on our personal experiences and finding the courage to speak out meant for many of us a profound challenge to patriarchy itself. Feminism has taught me that the stories that we tell are what make our lived experiences coherent to us. They give us an anchoring point from which our own stories make sense. If the stories of a whole group of people are missing from popular consciousness, our understanding of where and who we are is skewed, and the implications of this are massive. What did this mean in terms of the film? It meant an unequivocal feminist point of view, one that honored the voice, experience, and the history of women who had long fought for and are fighting for a transformation in women's lives. In this context of how personal experience can lead to political change, I want to quickly mention two women. While their stories were not explored in the documentary, they touched me deeply. And they touched me because in them I saw how transformational change takes place through individual action and how this change can impact women's lives in real and powerful ways. They were an interesting counterpoint for me as I looked at the massive pink events that we were led that we are led to believe will also lead to major a major reshaping in the landscape of this disease. The two women are Rose Kushner and Irma Natanson, and both stories deal with the issues of informed consent. It's been said that, <clears throat> excuse me, that Rose Kushner was probably the single most important person 
in ending the practice of one-step surgery for breast cancer. Because of her persistence and because she brought medical information to a wide public audience that otherwise might have remained unaware of the options. She was relentless in the face of wide criticism by the mainstream medical profession and the American Cancer Society. And because of her work, in 1979, the Halstead radical mastectomy would no longer be the standard treatment for suspected cases of breast cancer. I read about Irma Natanson in Ellen Leopold's magnificent book, Under the Radar, Cancer in the Cold War. Natanson versus Klein was a landmark case. For the first time in a public arena, the case exposed quite literally the horrific damage done to women's bodies by prevailing breast cancer treatments. Natanson had undergone cobalt radiation treatment in 1955. As Leopold writes, Irma Natanson was not a pioneer nor a celebrity, but she was instrumental in setting in motion a debate on the emerging doctrine of informed consent. As I mentioned, Irma's story had a profound impact on me. The fact that there was a first, that many women had to be the firsts in this experimenting on women's bodies. I recognize that change does happen, even if slowly and incrementally, and even if it doesn't feel like it. Change happens because involved and committed people keep pushing. Women like Rose Kushner, like Irma Natanson, Charlotte Haley, and Barbara Brenner. Pink Ribbons, Inc. did reach a vast audience, and thanks to the work of Breast Cancer Action and other organizations, it continues to be used as a tool to inspire new conversations and actions for positive social change. When I was producing the film, there was something else that became very important, that this film should serve as a record, a record of our work, our activism, our voices, and our history. And now I'm going to hand it over to John. Thank you, Rubina. Okay, everyone, it's half time here, so take a big whiff. Who doesn't love a pleasant scent? Smell is powerful. It can trigger memories, and it affects your mood. Vanilla is America's favorite smell. Vanilla makes you feel young, energized, and protected because it reminds us of breast milk. But you may not realize how powerful scent is. Studies have shown that 90% of buying decisions are subconscious. Scent can change your behavior while shopping. A store in the Pacific Northwest sprayed vanilla in the women's apparel department, and guess what happened? Sales doubled. So it makes sense that scent has become the secret sauce of consumer products. And clever product marketers are using our sense of smell to tap into our wallets. I'm going to read a list of products. Close your eyes and see if you can imagine their smell. Shampoo, air freshener, perfume, cologne, candles, lotions, soaps, shaving cream, lipstick, laundry detergent, and cleaning supplies are all infused with synthetic scents. You can open your eyes. Scent is powerful. And that's why you'll also find synthetic odors in places you wouldn't expect, like bowling balls and toilet paper. Please save your laughter to the end. Tampons, crayons, and there's even banana-smelling condoms. I mean, there's got to be a better way to get potassium, right? But my curiosity with scent started with a pair of pajamas I'd ordered online for my daughter from a store called Justice. The pajamas weren't advertised as a scented product, but they arrived with a strong odor. I just wanted to find out what makes the pajamas stink, and that's where Stink, the movie, began. First I called the pajama retailer Justice and asked them about the mysterious stink. They said the ingredients were secret, but they assured me there was nothing to worry about. All the chemicals used in the pajamas were safe because of the government's strict laws and regulations. But something smelled fishy. So I called the federal agency that regulates pajamas. 
not only did they have no idea about what chemicals were used in the stinky pajamas, but most alarming, they told me there is no list of chemicals prohibited in children's sleepwear. Companies can use whatever chemicals they want, and they don't have to tell us. They can just say it's a trade secret. So they left me with no option but to send the pajamas to a lab for a chemical analysis. Ridiculous, right? Like most Americans, I always assumed that if a product was on the shelf, that it was safe. I figured that someone, somewhere, was responsible for making sure that the products had safe ingredients. But the fact that this company didn't want me to know what chemicals were in the pajamas made me very curious about the pajamas specifically, but also about the system that I assumed was in place to regulate these products. To me, it just seemed like common sense that if you're buying a product, then you should have the right to know what's inside it, right? But that's not how the system works in America. Fragrance is not what I thought. There's a disconnect between the flowery words and imagery used to describe fragrance and the actual ingredients used to make fragrance. Let me explain. When you see the word fragrance on a product label, it appears to be a singular ingredient, but it's not. This vague word, fragrance, is used instead of disclosing hundreds of different chemicals that go into making a single scent. And pretty much anything could be in a fragrance formulation, including things that are nasty, like whale vomit, goat urine, and beaver anal secretions, and things that are downright dangerous, chemicals that can cause cancer, birth defects, and disrupt your hormones. Remember our vanilla scented products? They may smell like vanilla, but there may not be real vanilla in it. When it comes to fragrance consumer products, mostly synthetic petrochemical ingredients are used to mimic real smells, all because it's cheaper to make. That's one of the industry secrets. Which reminds me of a famous quote by Richard Nixon's attorney, John Dean. He said, when people keep secrets, it's usually for a reason. And speaking of Nixon, in 1971, President Nixon started the war on cancer and appointed a prestigious panel of scientists to find a cure for the disease. Every two years since, the President's Cancer Panel produces the President's Report on Carcinogens to help identify cancer risks. The 2009 re edition reported that environmentally induced cancers have been grossly underestimated and strongly urged action to reduce people's widespread exposure to carcinogens. The panel advised President Obama to use the power of the office to remove the carcinogens and toxins from our food, water, and air that needlessly increase health care costs, cripple our nation's productivity, and devastate American lives. The panel's advice hit very close to home. Because my wife died of cancer the same year this report came out. And now, like any parent, I'm just trying to protect my kids. But how can we protect our kids from chemicals that we want to avoid if companies don't have to disclose them on product labels? Because companies aren't transparent about all the chemicals in their products, we have to depend on government agencies to protect us. So the question is, are these federal agencies protecting us from chemicals? As you may recall from your high school civics class, we vote for our representatives in Congress. Congress passes laws that give federal agencies the authority to regulate. When it comes to chemicals, we have the Environmental Protection Agency. EPA is supposed to regulate the 85,000, that's right, 85,000 chemicals in commerce. Unfortunately, the 1976 law that is supposed to keep harmful chemicals off the market is broken. EPA has only banned five chemicals in the last 40 years, and it basically gave up 25 years ago after it was unable to ban asbestos. 
a substance so deadly it has its own signature cancer. Personal care products, cosmetics, and fragrances are in theory regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. But in reality, the FDA doesn't test these products for safety before they go on the market, nor are they allowed to demand an ingredient list from a company it regulates. Does that sound like regulation to you? Companies are on the honor system, and as I mentioned earlier, it's perfectly legal to use chemicals that can cause cancer, birth defects, and disrupt hormones in personal care products, and they do. America used to be the best in product safety, but not anymore. In the U.S., chemicals are innocent until proven guilty, whereas in Europe, for example, it's the opposite. In the EU, companies need to demonstrate safety before a product goes on the market. Maybe that's why 10 chemicals are banned in American consumer products and 1,400 are banned in Europe. By the way, there's obviously much more than my 60-second regulation summary, and I'm happy to dive deeper during the Q&A. Suffice to say, the system that is supposed to protect us is broken. And this puts American consumers in a real bind. It's called the cancer loophole. The government warns us to avoid toxic chemical exposure, but allows companies to sell products with the same chemicals that the government wants us to avoid. Now, if this sounds ridiculous to you, well, it's only because it is. And it's not just cancers that are on a rise. Rates of autism, diabetes, reproductive problems, and obesity are growing too. And people are starting to wonder why. What's the connection between the chemicals we're exposed to every day and our own health? This makes the ingredient secrecy issue even more frustrating. As I found out with my pajamas, because of labeling loopholes, companies don't need to tell the truth about what's in their product. This means that Americans don't get to choose all the chemicals we're exposed to. Industry gets to choose for us. Industry's reason for hiding ingredients is simple. They're afraid of losing a sale. They're concerned that if you knew the details about what's inside their product, then you might choose a safer product. And the last thing industry wants to do is reformulate the product with better ingredients, because more helpful ingredients usually cost more money. So, the industry strategy to avoid reformulation is twofold. Make sure chemicals aren't banned or restricted, and two, make sure they don't need to disclose ingredients, especially bad ones. But these companies have brand equity and reputations to protect. How can they put on a smiley face to the world about their products while simultaneously fighting regulations that would ban bad chemicals without looking like slimy hypocrites? Solution, hire someone to do the dirty work. They're called trade associations. Trade associations with names most Americans have never heard of serve as front groups for all the consumer-facing companies that we know. These trade associations spend hundreds of millions of member-raised dollars to avoid regulation so that its members don't have to disclose or remove dodgy ingredients from the products. But do you know what the worst part of this dysfunctional system is? We're paying for it. Let me explain. Look at the consumer at 12 o'clock. That's us. When we buy products from retailers, we may be supporting companies that pay dues to trade associations like the American Chemistry Council and the Personal Care Product Council. They use our money to hire lobbyists. These lobbyists bring cash to Congress and somehow, and I'm sure this is a coincidence, they're able to convince Congress to keep the status quo in place so that business isn't burdened with removing harmful chemicals from its products. And as long as we keep buying these products, they'll keep making them. And the bad system will remain in place. Now, if you'd like to hum somewhere over to the rainbow to yourself, that's perfectly fine at this point in the presentation. Anyway, 
I discovered two things while making stink. There's a big difference between our perception of products and reality. Scent is just one example of how we're manipulated and exposed to chemicals without even knowing it. That's why it's important to ask a lot of questions about the products that go in, on, and around our bodies. The second thing, this, the system to regulate chemicals in America stinks. It really does. It's disgraceful that money and politics taints the regulatory process at the expense of human health and the environment. Money is not just a problem when it comes to chemicals. Money in politics is probably the biggest problem with our democracy today. If we can't fix that, then we're in trouble. But I digress. Back to stink. So, what can we do now? For starters, don't buy products from companies unwilling to disclose ingredients. There's a reason they're not disclosing them. Tell your representatives at the state and federal level that the laws that are supposed to regulate toxic chemicals stink. Call them, email them, fax them, and reach out on social media too. Support and get involved with organizations like Breast Cancer Action that are fighting for human health and the environment. And cheer up. It's not all doom and gloom. There's a lot of good things happening too. Many consumers are already demanding safer products and forward-thinking product manufacturers are listening. Some companies are voluntarily making more helpful products and disclosing all ingredients. Not because they have to, because it's the right thing to do. Some retailers are being proactive too, by telling its vendors that they want certain ingredients removed from products or disclosed, or they won't sell them. Basically, these retailers are doing what the regulators should be doing. We're hoping that Stink can be a catalyst for change, and we'd love your support. Thanks for listening, and we'd love to take your questions now. Thank you so much, John and Ravita. Um, and we're going to be opening it up to questions in, in just one minute. But before we do, I just want to take a minute to talk about uh, what you can do and how you can get involved with Breast Cancer Action. You can sign up to become a member. You can um, sign up to get our news and action e-alerts and keep up to date on all the issues that we work on, including when our next webinars are. You can join us on Facebook and Twitter to connect with others and help change the conversation about the breast cancer epidemic. You can spread the word. You can help others get involved. Tell your friends, coworkers, and family about this webinar and also how they can get involved. And last, you can donate to support our educational and advocacy work, like our webinar series. So again, just reminding you that we rely on your support to make these webinars possible. And if you would like to make a donation, you can go to bcaction.org backslash donate. I want to give a really big thank you to John and Ravita for their presentations today. And now we're going to open it up to any questions you might have on this topic. And as I said before, the question bar is in your control panel on the right-hand side. You could type in your question um, at any time as we're going through our questions. So I'm going to start um, with the first couple of questions. The first question um, for both John and Ravita are, uh, where can people see these films, both of your films? Uh, yeah, you can see uh, Pink Ribbons, Inc. Um, on Netflix if uh, you're a subscriber. <clears throat> in uh, uh, Canada, it's distributed by the National Film Board, uh, so you can go to their website, nfb.ca, where you can download to rent or own. Uh, in the uh, U.S., it's first-run features, and you can also contact uh, Breast Cancer Action directly. That has a partnership with a distributor so that the film is uh, can be made available for screenings. And, and Stake is just in the middle of its um, festival run. But if you check in at stinkmovie.com, we're going to be announcing a theatrical release uh, later in the year, um, end of November, December, and then it'll be available digitally in uh, Q1 of 2016. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm just following up on what Ravita said, Breast Cancer Action um, is working with First Run Features to offer um, 
the DVD of Pink Ribbons Inc. to our members for screening in their communities. And we also have some educational materials we can pair with the film. So if you're interested, you can contact me, um, Saru Kaiser, and um, I'll, you'll be receiving an, a follow-up email from me so you can respond to that email if you have any questions. So there's a, a question, um, Ravita, for you about um, sort of the, the subject of the women who participate in the walks and runs that are um, highlighted and featured in your film. And, and can you talk a little bit about sort of how you manage the, that sensitive nature of both critiquing um, walks and runs while also um, sort of portraying these women who participate in them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is a, a subject and a question that, that comes up a lot. Uh, this is something that we were extremely sensitive to and something that generated a lot of discussion, certainly for us, the, uh, the team. Um, I mean, we were clear that we wanted to document the, the kind of participation that take, is taking place in, in the walks and runs and at some of the major events. Um, but we were also very cognizant of the fact that we we didn't want to to present the women in 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 any way that would discredit what they were trying to do. As as some of you you know and and would may agree with that for for many of the participants, it's a form of community and it's it's a form of empowerment. So we we certainly didn't want to take away from any of that. Uh, I think what we tried to do in our approach to the best, in the best way possible was to simply document the events, to be there and to show how, how women were participating in it. Uh, and I think that the, the real discussion happens when we, we would come together, whether it was at a community-based screening or at, or at, at festivals where uh, some of the women who were participating in the runs were able to speak about how they felt when they saw themselves reflected in the image and that the women themselves were able to critique how and how and whether there were different ways that they could be participating in such events. So yeah, it was something that we were very cognizant of and we also tried in many ways when we were at the events to talk and interview the women as much as we could. Great, thank you. This is a question for both of you. Um, someone was interested in if either of you have had any contact with the corporations um, and or charities that you highlight in your film, um, either positive or negative. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I had a lot of contact with, with all the companies that are mentioned in the film. And the, you know, the, the reality is they don't want to disclose their ingredients. And that's the whole point of the film, that I think that um, if you're buying a product, you should know what's in it. Uh, if, if one product, if you're looking at shampoo, for example, and you're, you're undecided, one has chemicals that cause cancer and birth effects, one does not, that might impact your decision. And so I just, you know, have a disagreement with these companies. And their party line is we don't disclose ingredients because it's a trade secret. So... You know, we uh, we'll, we'll see when the film's released if they still have a problem that people are going to see that that's their um, that's where they stand on the issue. Um, yeah, we as I mentioned during my presentation, it was it was fairly challenging to get the some of the companies to participate in the film, and I'm I was very pleased that we did managed to speak to, obviously, uh, you know, Nancy Brinker and to some of the key people behind the campaigns at the Ford Motor Company, uh, Avon Foundation, Estee Lauder. And we were certainly put through uh, an incredible amount of scrutiny before they agreed to be in the film. And what I made sure always was to be very transparent. Uh, so we didn't solicit any of the interviews without fully disclosing the fact that the film was based on Samantha King's book and that they were welcome, obviously, to look at that so that they would know that there was going to be a, a critical point of view in the film. 
Having said that, once the film was launched and uh, received a lot of press and exposure, we never heard back formally from any of those uh, companies or corporations, uh, either positive or negative, and, which was a little disappointing, but also uh, in some ways a relief. Thank you both. Um, John, someone has a question um, just about your thoughts on for an issue like what Think the Movie um, is talking about, um, sort of where consumer pressure at versus sort of larger regulation, sort of where those two things lie in actually changing uh, this issue? Well, I think in terms of consumer pressure, the, the challenge now is that um, most people just assume that everything on the shelf is safe. And I think that from a corporate standpoint, they're not going to um, be proactive in either reformulating and or disclosing ingredients unless it's widely known. Um, you know, the other issue is that at a certain, uh, as you move up the socioeconomic ladder, let's say, and certain portions of the population can afford to buy safer products, whether they're going to Whole Foods or somewhere else, you know, maybe they could, those people could shop their way around this problem. But, but that's not fair, and the industry um, shouldn't be able to get away with this simply because some people are sort of opting out of buying their products, and, and the people that, uh, the majority of the population doesn't even know this problem exists. Um, so, you know, I guess that's my long-winded way of saying, un until this is a kind of a widely known issue, I don't think the largest companies are going to do anything. Um, in terms of regulation, you know, it's 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 tough. The um, the industry has a lot of money. I know we've heard this before, and you know they they can they're getting away with it, and and that's why, you know, to me, just making the issue about transparency as opposed to going after uh, individual chemicals, I think that you know if you give people the choice, it'll change what they buy, and I think that any reasonable person who hears that message will agree. It's, it's only the people that are taking advantage of the loopholes that would disagree. Great. Thank you so much. Ravita, someone uh, has a question for you, um, both about if you were to do sort of a follow-up to Pink Ribbon Zinc, um, what that might look like, and also sort of what, what are you currently working on? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was, when, around the time that we were sort of, I guess, in the editing stages of, of the film and, you know, that moment when you are trying to, to wrestle with so much material and wondering what, what stays, what goes, the entire uh, section on the international uh, movement or movements around breast cancer and what a lot of these corporations and companies were beginning to do in Latin America, India, uh, different parts of Asia was was very interesting to me. Uh, so I think that would be or could potentially be an interesting follow-up uh, to the film. But I'm also I've also remained very interested in the personal and politi political lives of some of the women that I mentioned. His history is something that is always held a lot of interest for me, so uh, I know that some of the, the writing and stories, for example, in Ellen Leopold's book, uh, where I mentioned, I read the story of Irma Natanson also, I think, are, are very interesting. So some of that early political action, I think, around, around the disease is, uh, interests me a lot. Um, and what I'm working on now, I'm, I'm currently developing a couple of documentary, I, documentary ideas. I've been thinking about uh, a subject for, I would say, close to 10 years that looks in an in-depth way at the issue of femicide or global violence against women, so I'm doing that. And I'm also working with another independent production company on a film that hopefully will expose some of the injustices of the prison system and women's experience in it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, John, someone asked if you ever did find out what the ingredients were in the pajamas. I did, but you know what I'm going to tell you? You have to wait and see the documentary. 
<laughs> Let's just say it wasn't something good. There's, there wasn't pumpkin juice. <laughs> Great. Well, that's a good, it's a good plug to go out and see the documentary and find out what happened. Um, so, following up uh, a little bit on John, what you were talking about with uh, regulation, what, what is your understanding of what's currently happening uh, around? Um, chemical regulation and, and updating uh, the sort of outdated laws you were talking about? Well, the, the update to the 1976 law that never worked is uh, a law that appears to be about the same. Um, and what's more troubling, or what's most troubling, is that there's this concept called preemption. And because the we have a really weak federal law, I think 30 states have passed laws to try to protect its citizens. And one of the elements of this weak federal law would preempt states, would block states from creating laws to protect its own citizens. So that, that, that's a big problem. Um, and it remains to be seen if, if the you know, quote unquote reform law will, will, be any, will be any better and a lot of people are saying it's actually worse. Uh, so that's for the, sort of the wholesale you know, chemical um, model. And then you have, you know, there's a, a bill that would, you know, update the cosmetics law. But that, in its current form, wouldn't change the fact that you can put any chemical you want and just say it's a fragrance formulation. And it wouldn't do anything about um, contaminants either. So it, it is an improvement, for sure. But it's not, it's still allowing the loophole that, um, you know, companies are getting away with it where they can put anything they want and just say it's part of a fragrance formulation. Um, with cleaning products in another category, um, companies don't have to disclose any of the ingredients in cleaning products and they can basically put whatever, whatever they want in there. And you know, it's sad, one thing I didn't mention, there are multinational corporations that actually have one version of a product that they sell in America and one that they sell, for example, in the European Union. Because the American version, you can use chemicals which aren't allowed in Europe. It's cheaper. Thanks for, for bringing that up, John. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a, a, an, a, an important and interesting sort of hypocrisy um, that's part of both the chemical industry as well as the cosmetic industry. Um, and you, you see it sort of across both of those in terms of different products being sold in different places based on what the regulation is. And it really sort of goes to show how powerful regulation can be in uh, making products safer. Right. And, and if, I was going to say one thing. And if you ask some of these companies why they don't at least allow Americans that have products that are as safe as the European version, they'll mm -hmm. say that the Americans prefer this version. They like this version better. Well, they haven't seen the other version, and most people don't know what they don't know about about this loophole. Um, so that it's not like they have a choice, and they said, "Yeah, we know that the you know European version is better, but we'd still like the American version." They just they just don't know. Great. I, I wanted to just for for people who are interested around the regulation um, around reforming the Toxic Substances Control Act, TOSCA. Um, there are two bills in Congress. There's one in the Senate and one in the House, and both of them are really not um, going to make much of a change, and the Senate bill actually is going to sort of take us backwards and really gets into that preemption piece that John was talking about. And if people are interested, um, Breast Cancer Action follows both of those bills and that issue, um, and along with our participation with the Safer Chemicals Healthy Families Coalition um, are, are good sort of resources for more information on that. Um, let's see, there's a question to Ravita um, just about your um, sort of as you were developing this idea for the documentary, um, how did you decide on the director, Leah Poole? Uh, yeah, the, the process of finding a director took um, almost a year. I had sort of assembled a list of potential candidates and um, had many long conversations with them. Uh, I was obviously interested in finding someone with a lot of experience uh, and somebody who was, uh, you know, decidedly feminist and, and would be able to work with me to, to, to bring to life this critical point of view that I was very interested in. I 
had already met Leopold uh, because of another project that we'd been discussing, so I'd had a chance to get to know her a little bit and uh, decided to approach her to, to talk about some of the ideas. And uh, she, she was immediately taken with the ideas, really got it. She, you know, she asked for a little bit of time to read the book and to, to look at some of the material I'd gathered. Uh, before she came back to me and said she was interested. And my, my interest in seeking her out was also obviously had a lot to do with her work. Um, the fact that she was uh, a predominantly a uh, fiction uh, film director uh, and someone who I thought did make beautiful stories about the lives of women and girls and uh, could bring a very cinematic eye to a film that was going to be challenging in that it certainly felt like it was an academic exercise initially, uh, felt like a right mix, mix for, for us. Great. Thank you. John, there's a question to you. Um, in your research and putting together the movie Stink, um, and the, the pajamas were one example, were there other examples of products that you came across that um, just really stood out for you as um, really examples of the issues that you were um, sort of exploring in your film? I think the most eye-opening thing was the fact that, as you know, many products are outsourced. And if you ask a company if, you know, let's say for, I'll give you an example. Um, the same company that I bought the pajamas from, my daughter wanted nail polish, so I called the company and said, you know, my daughter wants this nail polish. Is there, is there formaldehyde in this nail polish? So to back up for a second, now here's, I, I knew that this is an issue. I knew that these companies are on the honor system and they can do what they want. So I go out of my way to specifically say, is there formaldehyde, which is a known human carcinogen, in this nail polish? And they assure me it's not. I even said, can you talk to the manager? I want to be really sure. Definitely not. Well, I send that to a lab it comes back and it has formaldehyde in it. So the problem is, even if you know what to ask, you still may not get the truth, and it's just absurd that someone should have to spend $500 to test a $5 nail polish. But once you, when you do, you find out that they lied to you. And I would say that every product I sent to a lab had something dodgy in it. Every product. I mean, and, and I, I, was, I was kind of going after the ones that, you know, were very common. But um, that, that's the biggest part. Like, even when you know, you, you still don't get a straight answer from these companies. And, you know, they can, at the end of the day, they can, they're not breaking the law. That's the worst part. They are not breaking the law. The law is broken. Thank you for that. And um, we're going to end with the last question, which is where can people get a copy of this webinar, or these slides? And, and I will say that we record all of our webinars and make them available on our website for people to view after the webinar has aired live. Uh, because Think the movie is not out in theaters yet, we're going to hold off on posting this um, for a little while. So. Um, I will let everyone know when it is available on the website and so that you can go and either watch it again or pass it on to other people who you think um, might like to see it. So I want to end by thanking everyone for their great questions and comments. And if we didn't answer your question today, you can follow up with us at info at bcaction.org. And you should also watch your email for a short survey where you can provide some feedback on this webinar and help us um, continue to make our webinar program better and better. So thanks everyone for attending and have a wonderful rest of your day.